All right, if that was the sermon, everybody go home. <laughs> no, the teaching text for this week is amazing, and we don't want to miss this. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. And it says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me to be a judge or an arbiter between you? And then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Please pray with me. Dear Jesus, there is incredible good news in this text, but this is a really hard message. And I'm a little nervous because I, it's beautiful, but I feel insufficient. And so God, I just want to ask that you help me to preach. Lord, if I've written down anything that's worth listening to, I ask that you open their ears, open their hearts to receive your word. Get me out of the way. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Once upon a time, there was a man named Bob. Bob was a saver. He was very tight with money. He was not a generous person. Now, his wife, Anne, she was more of a spender. So every day or every week when he would get their paycheck, he would take $20 out of his paycheck, cash, and stick it underneath his mattress. He felt secure having this amount of money underneath his mattress. It was like a warm security blanket filling him with comfort and ease. And then years later, he became very sick and he was about to die. And so he said to his wife, I want you to promise me one thing. There is a lot of money under my mattress. Will you promise me that when I am dead, you will take that money from under the mattress and you will put it in the casket with me? Well, Bob died and his wife kept her promise. She went to the bank, deposited all the money, wrote a check to her husband with the exact amount and put it in the casket with him. She said, you go ahead and withdraw that anytime you need. <laughs> Today is week two in our series called Affordable. We're walking through the parable of the rich fool, and we're, we're trying to ask the question, can we afford to handle money God's way? And last week, we kicked off talking about greed and how smart Christians can actually use their money to push back against greed that, that's creeping into our hearts. But this week, we're talking about security. How many of us use money as a security blanket? Like my man, Bob. How many of us turn to money when life feels unstable? When things feel uncertain, money keeps us from panicking. Just this past week, did you guys see the news story about the stock market? The stock market crashed this week. I mean, it was insane. I remember Monday morning, I'm sitting down to prep for this message, and I checked the news, and I saw that the, the markets in Japan crashed. Um, the lowest, it was the worst in Japan. And then it was in South Korea, then Taiwan, and then the markets in Europe took a plunge, and then in America, they sank as well. In Japan, they lost 12% of the market, which was the worst loss since 1986. I mean, it's decades. The Dow lost over 1,000 points, which came out to like a 3% plunge. And I remember thinking, wow, this story is going to dominate the headlines. This is all people are going to talk about. It's going to spiral, go crazy, and people are going to be really, really affected. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie, then my second thought was, man, that's good timing for my sermon. <laughs> Boy, that worked out. It was, I thought it was going to be a horrible thing. But then the very next day, the markets rebounded. They like skyrocketed back up in Japan. They gained 10%. So they, they still lost, but it was an enormous recovery. It's still crazy, but basically nobody panicked. And we all just kind of moved on with our lives. And I was reading this story this past week. And I realized when the Bible says, hey, don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. That's what they're talking about. 
Money can just come and go. The stock market can plunge and rise just in a matter of hours. And it really shows us how uncertain this whole thing is. And yet, how many of us are using money as a foundation? How many of us trust in our emergency fund more than our Emmanuel? If you want to grab your Bibles or uh, flip in your phone over to Luke chapter 12, and I haven't said this in a while, but my brother in Christ, Pastor Kyle, he's over at the Story Church. He's the one who coined the term, we are a BYOB church. And what he means is we are a bring your own Bible church. So we encourage you to bring your Bible. And my promise to you is if you bring your Bible, we will open it. We will use it. Um, And if you don't have a Bible and you don't know how to look it up online, I want to point you to our beautiful new bookcase that's on the back with all those Bibles. So if you need a Bible, you go grab one and you can keep it if you need, because truly we want people to have the word of God in their hands. Um, There's large print and regular and kids Bibles. Those are a gift from a friend. And so we're very happy to have that. Now, if you open up to Luke chapter 12, um, and so if you remember, I lost my spot here. So so if you were here last week, you might remember Jesus was teaching about security. He was teaching about worry and God's power. And then somebody interrupts him about uh, there's this guy who was whining about his big brother being mean to him. He says he won't share the inheritance with me, Jesus. And so Jesus, he's always the brilliant teacher. He pivots into a teaching moment. And we dive in in verse 15. And it says, Luke chapter 12, verse 15, it says, Then he says to him, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I will do. I will take tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. So we open up on this story of a farmer and we don't know much about him. Maybe he's a fantastic farmer or maybe he just had a really good year. We don't know. But what we do know is he has an abundance. He has extra. He's got more than he needs. And his first thought is not, how can I love God with my abundance? Or how can I love my neighbor with my abundance? No, no, no. His first thought is how can I love me with my abundance? He's trying to take the extra in his life and turn it into a security blanket. But here's the problem. And this is the first major teaching I want you to grab onto this morning. An abundance of money is not a security blanket. We try, we try so hard to use the ways of the world to protect ourselves. But the problem is it's not enough. Proverbs chapter 18 tells us in verse 11, it says, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. It is their shield against the chaos of the world. But if we back up one verse, verse 10, it says the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. So what we see is the Bible kind of sets it up as an either or, right? Either you can trust in money to protect you and take care of you, or you can trust in God. Money is not a bad thing, but it is not a security blanket. God needs to be your fortified tower, your security blanket, your refuge. The funny thing is (laughs) money is a poor man's substitute for inner peace and security. Now, here's what's obvious a little bit you don't believe me. Just like you don't believe someone when they say, well, money can't buy happiness. And you're like, yeah, (laughs) sure. Money can't buy happiness, but boy, it can buy coffee and gummy bears. That's pretty much the same thing, right? (laughs) Actually, we do need to take a second with this, okay? So far in this sermon, I have said two things that no one in the room actually believes. Number one, money is not a good security blanket. And number two, money cannot buy happiness. But let me see if I can explain it like this. I've got this length of rope over here. Maybe you noticed it earlier. And it's it's here. And I want you to imagine that this rope goes on literally forever, right? It doesn't. It's it just ends in my little spool over there. But just imagine like this rope just goes wraps around the world a couple times. It's an infinite rope. It just goes on forever and ever. Just pretend. Now, let's imagine that this rope is a timeline, 
And by the way, this illustration comes from a a personal hero of mine, Francis Chan. I want to give credit. Um, But imagine this rope is a timeline of your existence. You exist forever. Now, do you see this part here? It's marked with some lovely orange tape, right? That is your life on this earth. You've got a few short years here on this earth, and then we just have eternity somewhere else. Yes? This is your existence. What blows me away is that some of us, and I'm not going to say some of you, because I'm in this too. This message hit me right before it's going to hit you. Like, I'm sharing it with you now, but it hit me this past week. I'm in this too. Some of us, all we care about is the orange part. We are so consumed with the orange part. We go, oh, I can't wait till I get to this part, right? And then actually, most of us are consumed with this part, right? here. Yes. And we look at this and we're like, oh man, I can't wait till I get to right here. You know what? I'm going to work hard and I'm going to work and work and work and I'm going to save and save and save so I can enjoy this part right here. We are consumed with this. We are obsessed with the last half an inch of the orange part. We wonder, oh man, am I going to get to travel enough? Am I going to eat well? And, and it's like, are you kidding me? What about this part? Look at all of this. And we're consumed with this part right here. And it's crazy because the Bible teaches us that what I do during the orange part determines how I am going to exist for millions and millions of years forever. And yet we're so concerned. Why would I spend this time, the orange part, why would I try to make myself the most comfortable as possible for this last half an inch, trying to enjoy myself as much as I can? Why would that be my focus? What if I spent my time? What if I invest my life for this moment, the end, the moment of mission where I cross the finish line and enter into glory and eternity with Jesus? I mean, we've got one chance at this life, one chance, and it can all end for us at any second. We've got one chance at eternity. I'm not going to be fooled. So when I say stuff like money is not a security blanket or money can't buy happiness, people look at how the Christians will live their life and some of their decisions that we make by giving to other people and not having for ourselves. And they think, well, you're just being stupid. This is going to affect your life. It's going to change your life. You're being dumb. And I say, no, you're being stupid because you're living your whole life for this. I'm focused over here. Isn't that smarter? Listen to the way Jesus puts it. He puts it in Matthew chapter 16. He says, chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what could anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the son of man is going to come in his father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Look, I'm not stupid. You're not stupid. We live in a world that runs on money. Money is a fantastic security blanket for this part. Right? It is. It's a great security blanket for this. But it means absolutely nothing for the rest of your existence. Back in our teaching in Luke 12, it says in verse 4, Uh, before our teaching text in verse four, he says, I'll tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but after that can do no more. What I will show you who you should fear. Fear him who after your body has killed has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. An abundance of money is not a security blanket, but there is a God in heaven who loves you and gives you value. And he and his presence alone is a strong fortress, the firm foundation that you need to build your life on. So let's jump back into the parable of the rich fool. There's a farmer and he has an abundant harvest and he's got this plan to build bigger barns. And it says in verse 19, 
And he says, then this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And I will store my surplus grain. And then I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I got lots of stuff. I'm going to build a bigger barn and take it easy for the last couple of years. It's funny because that sounds an awful lot like the retirement plan of every human being I have ever met. (laughs) Right? But here's what I realized when I was reading this text last week. I said that it hit me in the gut last week. Because you know the next sentence, right? The next sentence, verse 20, it says, But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Jesus perfectly describes what I would say is a super normal life plan of like every single American. And then in the next line, he says, you fool. And what I realized is that the American dream is not God's dream. The American dream of working hard for 30, 40 years until death, that is not God's dream. And sometimes it feels like Jesus is out here poking holes in our retirement plans. (laughs) Now, I want to pause for a moment and give some comfort to my friends who are retired. If you just realize that you're living the life of the rich fool, let me come alongside you for a moment. God is not mad at someone for being retired. Okay, please do not hear judgment or anger or, or aggression. You didn't do anything wrong, right? And it's not wrong to, to it's, it's not your fault that this is the dream we were given, that this is our cultural inheritance. I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty for retirement. What I'm trying to show you this morning is that God has something even better in mind for your life. I'm trying to invite you into a more meaningful life. Whether you get paid for your job or not, that has nothing to do with it. Listen, let me, let me show you this from another angle. We don't have to be limited by this life. Right? We don't have to be limited by this life. You don't have to color inside the lines of a box that was drawn for you by the few years you have in this life. If you want your life to count, make it count for eternity. If you want your life to count, you don't have to have a high IQ. You don't have to have good looks or lots of money. If you want to live a life that echoes into eternity, you can make a massive difference in this world if you have the priorities of God's kingdom at heart. You have the ability to be used by God to bring people in your life closer to Jesus. Sometimes Christians will say stuff like, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. And what I want you to realize is that you could be the reason someone spends their life in eternity. You could be the person God works through to bring someone into paradise, into eternity. God could work through you to bring his love into their life. They might find out about Jesus. You could be the one to introduce someone to their Lord and Savior and give them access to eternal life because of something you did. And I am not saying that you have to go become a preacher. No. I'm saying there could be something as simple as you brought cookies to your neighbor and you prayed for them when they were recovering from a surgery. Or you you cooked a meal for a friend who just lost their job. Some people, you could make your life count. You could make your life make a difference for eternity. Some people don't want that. They just want their own personal, they just want to be liked. They want to finish school, get, you know, get a good job, find a husband, wife, nice house, nice kids, work for a few years, and then have a nice little vacation at the end. And so many people in our world limit themselves to that. They don't think beyond this life, and that is a tragedy in the making. There's this guy, John Piper. He's a pastor for a long time at a church. I think he's retired now. But he, at one point when he was a pastor, this is a long time ago, he got a news report. The two of their missionaries, their church sent missionaries all over the world, and two of their missionaries had been killed in Cameroon. There were little old ladies on missionary. They were both in their 80s, and they were serving God their whole life. One was a doctor and one was a nurse. And they poured their whole life out for one thing, to make Jesus known to the sick and the poor in some of the hardest and most unreached places in the entire world. They went from village to village to help people. They would heal people with medicine, and then they would tell them about Jesus. This is an amazing life they lived. And then one day, they were traveling between the villages, and the brakes went out in their car. And they went off a cliff and they died instantly. And when John Piper got this news, he asked his church, he said, is this a tragedy? 
And then he read them a story from Reader's Digest, which should show you how old this story is, right? It's like 2001, this story. Bob and Penny took an early retirement from their jobs. They live now in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they go boating every day and they spend all their time collecting seashells. And he holds up the two stories and he says, which one is a tragedy? The two women who devoted their entire life to sharing the love of Jesus, who died an instant death and found themselves in the arms of their savior, or the couple who at the end of all things will stand in front of God with nothing to show for their life except a really nice seashell collection. The American dream is not God's dream. And we can make our lives echo into eternity with incredible significance, but not if the ultimate goal of our financial planning is a really nice seashell collection. God made you for more. So don't waste your life. The story finishes in Luke chapter 12, verse 20. I'm just going to read it again. It says, but God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but it is not rich towards God. This is how it is for whoever is not rich towards God. Now, I don't know about you guys. This, this was a really hard message to write because I think it's a really challenging teaching that we are grappling with. And I guess I, I want you to know I'm struggling with this too. Okay, I don't want anyone to misunderstand. I have a retirement account. I look at it sometimes and I wonder, what am I doing, right? I, I, I want to you know, provide for myself when I'm not able to work anymore. But at the same time, I want my life to have eternal significance. I don't want to just be focused on this life. And just very simply, what I'm seeing in the Bible, what it's very clearly telling us, it's like, I want to be rich towards God. I want to figure out how do I get to be rich towards God? Because if we are rich for ourselves, God calls us a fool. If we are rich for ourselves, God says, you're a fool. I don't want to be a fool, Right? So I got to figure this out. How can I be rich towards God? First Timothy chapter six, verse 17. And I know, I, I know I'm jumping around the Bible a lot, but this truth is stamped all over the Bible. First Timothy chapter six, verse 17. It says, command those who are rich in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they will take hold of the life that is truly life. I want to take hold of the life that is truly life, to be rich in good deeds, generous and willing to share. Sounds a little backwards, but to lay up riches in heaven, the eternal invest investment plan, if you will, involves loving and caring for and sharing with the people around us. To have more then means that we're going to have less now. This has been Jesus's message for us since the beginning. When he stepped out of heaven, he laid aside the riches of paradise to enter into our world, to heal the sick, to give sight to the blind, to feed the hungry, to offer forgiveness for the sins of the world. And then he looks at us and he says, this is what it's like to live in my kingdom, to care for people and to, to take care of the needs of the people around us. Sacrificial love is the greatest indicator of riches in heaven. Let me say that again. Sacrificial love, loving other people, sacrificial. That is the greatest indicator that you have riches in heaven. And Jesus gave the ultimate example of that, of that sacrifice when he died on the cross in our place. He took on our sins, our debt on himself. He died in our place so that we could be forgiven. All we need to do is call on his name to give our lives to him and we could be free. That sacrificial love, that's the ultimate sacrifice to give up your life for someone else. And that is why his name is the highest name. That is why he has been lifted up. Philippians chapter two outlines it like this. Chapter two talks about how he stepped out of heaven and he came to this earth and was willing to go to the cross. And then it says in verse nine, it says, therefore, because he died on the cross, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is because of his sacrificial love. If you want to figure out how to be rich towards God, the secret is sacrificial love, just like Jesus. The good news I have for you today is that your life can have eternal significance. God didn't make you for this little piece of tape, right? God made this little piece of tape to prepare you for an eternity with him in paradise, I say this all the time. <laughs> when I read the Bible, one of the first questions I ask is, what does this teach me about the God that's out there? What did I learn about the character of God? And I was reading this text this past week, and I don't think God's plan, I don't think God's point was to make us feel bad about retirement planning. I think God was trying to show us that significance doesn't come from money. When it comes to money in our lives, I think we get really frazzled and I think we get it all upside down, but we were made for bigger things. You were made for glorious, heavenly, eternal things, but we forget. We get so caught up in this little part right here that we forget that we are, all of this is preparation for eternity. Money is not your security blanket. God is because your life is only just the beginning. Your life is just the beginning. Think about the stock market, all that stuff, right? It fluctuated wildly last week. And it's amazing because you can look at the exact same retirement account on Friday and on Monday morning and on Tuesday morning, and you'll get three very different answers as to how much money you have. The value rises and drops, but that's not how it works with your life. If you put your trust in God, and you get your sense of purpose, your sense of value from God instead of from money. That value is steadfast. That value never changes. It's eternal. If God is your security deposit, then your value never changes. This actually goes way beyond money. Some people get their sense of value from their looks or from their prestige or from their parking spot or how many friends they have on social media. Some people get their value from how their kids are doing in school or how many months they get to spend in Florida during the winter. It rises and falls and disappears at the end of the day. But value that comes from God, richness towards God, treasures that you have stored in heaven, that never changes. So let me send you out with this challenge. I want you to ask yourself two questions this week as you pray and talk to God about your money and your security. The first question is, who are you counting on? Who do you count on when life gets tough? Do you put your trust in the stock market? Do you put your trust in your next purchase, in your next vacation? Do you put your trust in the government, in your children? Do you put your trust in your good health, in your friendships, your job? Who are you counting on when things go sideways in your life? There's a, a story that comes from a pastor named David Platt. And David Platt's an incredible human being with a massive heart for mission work. And he spends a lot of time trying to help the people in India. He does a lot of work there um, and trying to reach some of the most remote tribes in the entire world. And David, he's actually pretty famous. At one point, he was the youngest megachurch pastor in America. He, got a, he was appointed to the head of the, one of the largest churches in America when he was 25 years old. It was down in, Meg, uh, down in Alabama. And when he got there, this church had massive resources, so much money. And when he came on board, he, he kind of flipped them on their head and showed them how to look at their money. At one point, he looked at India, and there was this region up in the mountains that needed wells. They needed water. And they needed to build like 40 wells. And it was going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars because it's way up in the mountains and it's hard to get to. And they were like, we need $430,000 or something. And they're like, we don't have it. And so then David went looking at the church finances and he's like, I found it. There's a bank account. It has $450,000 in it. And the church leaders looked at him and said, no, 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 no. That's our emergency fund. We need that just in case. Do you want to guess what they did with it? <laughs> David Platt got them to use their emergency fund. They don't have it anymore. And they provided water to an entire region in India. This is the same guy. This is the same church that at one point um, he called up the Department of Human Resources in Shelby County, Alabama, where the church was located. And he said, how many families would you need in order to take care of every foster and adoption need that we have in our county? 
where the church is located. And the woman on the phone kind of laughed at him like, well, oh, oh, hmm. and he said, no, 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 really. If a miracle were to happen, how many families would be sufficient to cover all the needs you have? And she said, to be honest, we would need like 150 new families to sign on for foster care. So he got up in front of his mega church and he told them about the need. And 160 families signed up. Shelby County, Alabama had zero children in their foster care system at one point because of this church. That's a true story. And here's the quote from his book. We don't want even one child in our county to go without a loving home. It's not the American dream. It doesn't add to our comfort, our prosperity, or our ease. But we are discovering the indescribable joy of sacrificial love for others. And along the way, we are learning more about the inexpressible wonder of God's sacrificial love for us. So this week, I want you to ask yourself, who, what are you counting on? Who are you counting on in your life? And the second question I want you to ask yourself, with the life and the riches that you have been given, what are you investing in? Where is all your time and all your money and all your energy going? Is it all right here in this little piece? Or are you, or are you doing it for this stretch right here? Where are you investing? Who are you counting on to save you? And how are you investing your life? Imagine there's a bank account and it credits, there's a bank account that you have and it credits your account each and every morning with $86,400 every single morning. But at the end of the day, whatever's left, they delete it and you get a fresh 86,000 the next day. What would you do if you had a bank account like that? If I had it, I'd pull $86,400 out of that bank every single day, right? I would use every penny they put in that bank account. Each and every one of us does have a bank like that. It's called time. And every morning, God gives us 86,400 seconds to live this life. And every night, we burn the remains of that day. We could live like this life. We, we could live it like the rest of the world, focused on me. We could take our abundance and we don't ask, you know, how can I love God or how can I love my neighbor? We could say, how can I love me? How can I pour into me? And that will get us exactly this far, right? But there is a better way. We could take our abundance. We could take our 86,400 seconds that each new sunrise brings and we could invest it. We could trust in God as the true source of our security and we could pour ourselves out for a world that desperately needs God's love. We could focus on the rest of the story. We could live a life with eternal echoes and become truly rich towards God. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, it's so hard. Your teachings are so challenging and our world has taught us to think of me first, to just be obsessed with the last half an inch of that tape, with the last little bit of our lives. We store up our abundance for me. But God, your word challenges us. Your word pushes us to, think, to put our security in you, to put our trust in you because you're the only one who will never fail. God, Please work in our hearts. Push us to lean on you, to live in a way that just the world looks at us and says, you're dumb. What are you doing? But we know, we know where the real riches are, Lord. Open our hearts. Open our eyes. We love you so much. In your name, amen.